the Indian nationhood has been imperfectly articulated and that the most perfected idea of our nation had been put forth by Chhatrapati Maharaj, uh, Maharaj Shivaji of the Marathas with his proclamation of Hindavi Swaraj. The call of Hindavi Swaraj transformed Indian spontaneous feeling about themselves, what they already had, into a conscious thought and a vision before their eyes to strive for and to realize. And the straightforward message enabled people to conceive the land, the greatness of their civilization that they were bearers of and the importance of preserving it and taking control of its destiny. When you say with, with conviction, without any doubt, unequivocally, that Hindu paramountcy, Hindu primacy, primacy of Hindu values in every, whether it is in share of resources, whether it is in policy, whether it is in any interface that the government has with the outside powers or even inside, in promotion of cultural ethos, we should not even attempt uh, to make people Indian who are not uh, Indians. Indianness is Hinduness and therefore Hindavi Swaraj. Today, I wish to speak about nationalism, a sentiment which is much maligned today in the uh, discourse, which is heavily influenced by the left liberal uh, intellectual ideological back, uh, bent that assumes to stand for global humanity and therefore seeks to break down what they call barriers uh, of presented by national identities. And uh, this is a specious aggressive rhetoric that is a new form of invasion, which intends to establish its own uniform ideological empire by assailing boundaries that protect uh, our national character, a unique character, our civilizational character and our culture. Now the first people who will fall prey to this are those whose sense of uh, what constitutes their national uh, character is on a weak foundation. Bringing the focus to India, it is one of the countries which after a prolonged subjugation under foreign powers and ideologies, it is now in a situation when uh, it has ignored the essential natural qualities uh, that constitute our national, sp uh, national spirit. And instead, uh, we base it on a weak superimposed set of ideas, uh, which have till now proven to be a very weak glue. Now, what is this vital for Indians? I will attempt to announce with uh, this historical uh, perspective. Now, we have based our national character on a superimposed set of ideas, which is based on Western statehood. This is what I want to talk about today, that what nationalism should be based on from a historical perspective. And for this reason, I am presenting the uh, uh, rundown. Now, I'm trying to cr crunch entire Maratha history in a very short uh, uh, capsule, just to go over what they, when we were fighting the invasions, what was our view of national character at that time? I mean, I'm not floating a proposi uh, proposition at the moment, so I'm just beginning with a question. Uh, the third battle of Panipat was fought in January 1761 between Marathas and the invading Afghans under Af Ahmed Shah Abdali. And it was in concert with a whole lot of Muslim forces from India. It was arguably one of the biggest battles. And it had a heartbreaking result, of course, the Maratha forces were forced to withdraw and an estimated one lakh Maratha soldiers died in the battlefield that day. Now the question is, who did they fight for? What were they defending? Why did they lay down their lives in that geographically distant location from um, uh, distant from their native Maharashtra? But we will not enter, uh, attempt to answer this question right away. And this is also not meant to suss out the motivations and background and circumstances of the battle. But in its background and other battles that the Marathas fought in the course of the rise and ebb of their power, starting right at the beginning from the Pratapgarh fort to attempt and answer a larger issue. It is in history that our consciousness as a nation is anchored. But in case of India, these have been laid down in rather shallow ground. The commonest refrain is, of course, that we were not a nation at all before the British subduing a whole lot of warring principalities politically united us. There have been indignant 
uh, rebuttals to this suggestion because this reduces the ancient nationhood to an infantile two centuries and it cuts out of relevance almost a 10 millennia of its existence, if not as a political entity, at least as an ethnicity and a civilization. One of the clearest references to Indian nationhood can be found in the Vishnu Puran that describes in very specific terms the constituents of Indianness, defining the geographical landmass that forms the identity of its native people. And we are referred to very clearly as Bharati. Uh, the second portion, uh, the second part of Vishnu Puran, uh, which itself is dated uh, roughly about the first millennia, millennium BC. And uh, in chapters three and four of the second volume, it enumerates in detail India's physical features, beliefs, practices, value systems, social arrangement, and also the tribes which are native to this land, and specifies the distinctive elements that set us apart from uh, those outside India's cultural complex. This definite idea existed all through and it can be seen in terms in the terms of references, uh, reference that we use for outsiders like Mlech, Yavan, Anarya and Turk. Now, diminutive references to Indian nationhood are thrown at us repeatedly. We are told, for instance, in this most recent one uh, by Audrey Trushka, the notorious India beta, that uh, most of our expressions relating to nationhood, whether it is the conceptualization as land of land as mother, what we refer to as Bharat Mata, also the devotion towards this ideation as a divine being, uh, which is Vande Mataram, and patriotism as a whole, with respect to India as a whole, all these have been only in the last one and a half centuries. But is that really so, that we never really had a conception of nationhood before colonial era? What has also not helped is the weak affiliation that Indians themselves have demonstrated with, along this identity through the ages. If you, we look at a past, it will show a number of instances where Indians have acted against this perceived uh, unit. There have been so many quizzlings in every battle, in every cause over the stretch of our history that it would appear there were more traitors among us than people who really held this vision of the nation in their minds. So it really appears it's a very troublesome aspect of the Indian character which one should actually study deeply. But there would not be possibly any race in the world in which we have so many among us who can go to such extent of self-serving pursuit so as to completely compromise the nation, even bring, bring upon it physical death and devastation. There are numerous such examples in our history. And just they somehow justify it to some unique individual viewpoint. Whether we look at the political scene now or we look at the uh, political scene through the entire stretch of our history, there have always been these people who will not stop short at even uh, directly betraying the country and even have it annihilated. So this cultural spiritual giant that we have among us, it seems to exist surrounding us, living and breathing, but then it's made of millions of small minded creatures who cannot perceive it in their minds and they go around each seeking, uh, seeking their selfish interests, limited to narrower and narrower spheres. So then is it true what these, what is normally alleged by people like this, that uh, national consciousness is mere response to imperialism and that uh, our nationhood is very inchoate and it is forced through external impulses that it does not naturally exist within us. And if it is not so, then what is it that constitutes our nationhood? To answer this is actually should be the most important function of history, but instead history has been relegated to a redundant study and where we study about some dynasties who contended among themselves for supremacy. Redundant because it has not been allowed to play a part in what is this con uh, consciousness or awareness of who we, who we are. There is no doubt that the British did provide a powerful machinery of government which brought about a cohesion that resulted in the formation of the modern Indian nation state. And, but uh, too much is made out of this politically demarcated and uniformly administered unit. We have plenty of examples around the world where, uh, for instance, artificial demarc uh, demarcations, 
where these do not necessarily take into account the historical course of a nation, its civilization, and there is endless conflict. There are plenty of such cases in the world. Now, if we even look at a recent history in the past one and a half year, century, uh, centuries or so, when India did exist as a political unity with very definite boundaries, we see a lack of awareness about the overall unity even in this time. So, it is not that we are really disloyal, but narrower group interests and identities, ideological imperatives, these predominate and override the interests of the overall unit. Clearly, the assumption of political and administrative unity as the basis of nationhood has been insufficient in reinforcing nationhood. This does not mean that political unity is superfluous, but that by itself doesn't make national consciousness. The other thing is that the constitutional structure of these modern states today is based on certain doctrinal assumptions that do not necessarily are not necessarily consistent with the ethos of our, uh, all nations and particularly in case of India. Indian nationhood has been kept beholden to a set of extraneous ideals that do not serve her interests. They do not correspond to our cultural experience and some of them even go against our naturally evolved wisdom. And instead of appealing to that part within all Indians that is the real basis of unity, we have pushed this idea of constitutional patriotism propagating through the various means of state these superficial set of ideas as the basis of a nationhood. Now, insistence on compliance to a flawed set of ideas is the main reason that Indian national con consciousness is on a very shaky foundation. Superficial principles will not really inspire a people to act with a uniformity of purpose. And some of these most pernicious ideas, the foremost among them is of course secularism, also foreign parameters of measuring social justice and well-being in society and of course the grossly distorted historical and sociological narrative. Now my major premise is therefore that Indian nationhood has been imperfectly articulated and that the most perfected idea of our nation had been put forth by Chhatrapati Maharaj, uh, Maharaj Shivaji of the Marathas with his proclamation of Hindavi Swaraj. The minor pre premise in this is that the idea of secularism is actually detrimental to us as a nation, not just on account of a spurious version which is practiced in India, that is minoritism under the garb of secularism, but because it is a morbid self-abnegating dogma that directly runs counter to our na uh, nationhood. Now beginning with the Islamic invasions, the terms prevalent in ancient India to describe outsiders like Mlech, Yavan and Turk etc. came to be used in the subsequent period almost exclusively for Muslims. Interestingly, this allusion included Muslim converts, uh, converts to Indian converts to Islam. It was a realization that change of religion resulted in altered allegiances and racial commonality did not invoke in the converts a loyalty towards their uh, national or native civilizational unit. Conversely, the term Hindu was used for adherence of Indic belief systems, those who shared the same philosophical concepts like dharma, karma, arth, kam and moksha, sansar and the same uh, rules of social association, the rites of passage, which are called sanskars. This common character of Indic religious religions contrasted with the Semitic counterparts, which were also antagonistic towards Indian beliefs and even outright hostile to their uh, existence, which we have seen played out through history. And that the basis of endemicity became the most natural expression of nationalism amongst Indians. The identity Hindu is what is constitutive of nativeness. Uh, the term itself came into use much later, somewhere in the medieval period. But the framework of values that uh, this conveys, uh, the uh, sensibilities and beliefs, uh, this became the rallying point of all those who were fighting uh, Islamic invasions since the earliest times, even before the term Hindu became prevalent. And instead of being a vague and indeterminate concept, the characteristics and components of being Indian was very unambiguously and descriptively outlined, not only in our texts, but it was also affirmed in the actions of Indians who were resisting the invaders. 
uh, these are noted in many of the inscriptions of Hindu kings also who were grappling, uh, grappling with the Yavanas and it's enunciated in no uncertain terms what is it that they were fighting for. And this included upholding the traditional Indian social structure. I give an example here, the, there are inscriptions of the Andhra Nayaka kings. Now they were Shudra kings but in their inscriptions they very clearly enunciate that okay we are the proud uh, class which is born out of the feet of Vishnu, we are the proud uh, uh, Shudras and we are the protectors of the Brahmins and cows and uh, of uh, uh, the Dharma against the Yavanas. Now obviously uh, this uh, suggestion that the so called lower caste welcomed Islamic invasions is completely bogus. Every king, whichever uh, strata the uh, dynasty was formed from, they all upheld the Indian social structure, the typical framework which is referred to in the Vishnu Puran of the society, of the religious beliefs, of their sanskars, of the rites of passage, these were all upheld by all the kings who were fighting all through. And this was the basis of their fight back against those who were from outside. There are also others like in Lakshman Sen's uh, in inscription writings and then in Gahadwal inscriptions and even in the later stage we see that outlined even in Guru Gobind Singh's uh, proclamation when he uh, founded the Khalsa. At the inception he said uh, this thing, Sakal Jagat Khalsa Pant Gaje Jage Dharma Hindu Torak Bhandavaje. So this was uh, a clear proclamation that okay we are Hindus versus the Turks. Similarly, I mean, in case of uh, Savai Jai Singh II, he came uh, to throne around 1700. When he started initially distancing himself from the Mughal uh, yoke, the first thing he did was that he did away with the title of Mirza Raja. He had adopted Sanskrit titles, he adopted Sanskrit and uh, local dialects for his deeds and official documents and he also initiated Vedic rites like Ratsu, Su, Yayag, Ashwamedh, etc. So, we see that Hinduness as synonymous with Indianness, this had existed all around. But not until Maharaj Shivaji of Marathas built his fight back along these lines of the identity of Indians as a whole, do we see it applied as a well-formed political philosophy for restoring prerogative to the Hindus. Now the call of Hindavi Swaraj transformed Indian spontaneous feeling about themselves, what they already had, into a conscious thought and a vision before their eyes to strive for and to realize. And this straightforward message enabled people to conceive their land, the greatness of their civilization that they were bearers of and the importance of preserving it and taking control of its destiny. And not just securing a narrowly defined political advantage which is what was happening before. Uh, from being reactive defensive spurts of the past, for the first time the efforts were set about a definite purpose and became an enduring struggle for reviving Hindu ascendancy and a force of reckoning. Once grasped, one could not lose sight of it because it is impossible to see and know and then unknow. And therefore the struggle did not die with Shivaji or Shivraya as he was known amongst his people. Long after uh, he had died also, the struggle was carried on and they kept this was a grail spelt out by the king and they kept it on till the very end. You can see this is what uh, Swami Vivekananda said about Shivaji that he was the very incarnation of Shiva and the deliverer of Hindus. Now since the time of taking oath and establishing Swaraj that he took at this shrine called Rohideshwara. It's a Shiva temple in Maharashtra along with a close group of friends. Shivaji uh, seems to have had this idea very clearly in his mind from what was the beckoning in his life and the purpose cut out for him as if it has been spelt out by the Almighty. He wanted to rid his land from the light of foreign rule, primarily of Muslim rule and this was put out Unequivoc unequivocally in his pronouncements as well as those of contemporaries who were closely associated with him. This is what he himself says that Rohideshwara will provide all kinds of aspirations for Hindavi Swaraj and that this Rajya should be established is in the mind of Sri. Whatever stratagem he, uh, he adopted, sometimes it was also playing one Muslim power against the others, uh, but gradually he rest power or from the entrenched Islamic rulers and every single campaign that he ended, uh, undertook was ultimately persevering towards this singular aim and not towards any self-serving goal. 
This focus on protecting, preserving and rebuilding the articles and edifices of Hindu civilization and belief was evident through the works undertaken by him from the very inception of his rule as also earlier during the phase when he was still in the process of establishing his power. This is what uh, Ram, uh, Ramchandra Pant Amatya, he was a famous minister of uh, Shivaji who continued for a very long time. He was the finance minister. This is what he says that he is the one who protected, he undertook to protect dharma and establish the gods and Brahmins in their due places. So we see here also they reinforce the traditional setup of India and every principle that the Indian uh, culture and civilization is based on. It is now only recently that we have actually started questioning every part of it, whether it is society, the religion, everything. Now, one of the important battles that Sh Shivaji took up was the Battle of Pratapgarh. He had already been in conflict with the Adil Shahis uh, for some time. He had grabbed the entire Nizam Shahi territory from them. Now, if you see what the Tariqi Adil Shahi says, one will know why Sh Shivaji took it up uh, to, uh, to uh, remove them. This is what Adil Shah says. Adil Shah thought the observance of Muhammadi faith would not bloom without the water of his bloodthirsty sword and the thorny bushes of infidelity and polytheism, which is Hinduism, would not burn without the fire of the enemy and consuming sword. So it is very clear what is it that they were faced with and they knew I mean, from their religion and culture, what their response should be. Uh, there are numerous instances also of them having oppressed Hindus also. There, there were temples destroyed in many places, including in Pandharpur and Tuljapur. Afzal Khan's inscription in Afzalpur even reads that the one who slaughters the rebels and infidels and the one who smashes idols. Now, the outcome of this battle is, of course, well known. We know that uh, Afzal Khan was killed by uh, Shivaji. How that happened, that has been very uh, dramatically even portrayed in many uh, tales and m many uh, series and all that also. But the uh, and uh, it was a decisive victory for the Marathas and they managed to free the areas of Vai, Panhal, Jawali from Islamic rule. And this was also the beginning of the decline of the Bijapur Sultanate. Now, uh, if you see, there was a letter which Adil Shah had written to Ekoji Bosle in which he says, our aim is to spread the religion of the chief of the prophets, Muhammad, and we are always blessed with victory. In another letter, Afzal Khan says to Shivaji, you conquered Kalyan and Bhivandi and demolished the mosques there. Muslims are angry with you as you have thoroughly plundered and humiliated them. Taking no cognizance of your own strength, you have imprisoned Muslim priests and dared audaciously to block the path of Islam. It was this arrogance of Islamic power that they felt entitled and justified in destroying Hinduism but could not be challenged and could not be hurt in return is what uh, Shivaji had shattered. Another uh, war, another campaign, that there were of course many campaigns, I am not going uh, to all of them, but another campaign which he undertook was the attack on Bardesh. This was a Portugal uh, territory and what you see in the background is a map of uh, Basain, which is uh, from the Portuguese atlas. It's a 1630 map. Religious persecution and forcible conversions were carried out not only by the Muslims, it was also carried out by the Christians in the British colonies as well and as well as the Portuguese, mostly in the Portuguese colonies. The uh, Portuguese colonies, of course, we have all heard about the inquisitions, uh, inquisitions, unimaginable atrocities on the local Hindus were perpetrated and they never had anyone to really protect them. So in November 19th and 20th, 1667, Shivaji invaded Portuguese colony in Bardesh with 5,000 foot soldiers and 1,000 horse and plundered the villages in the district. And then he withdrew to Dicholi after three days. He also uh, got two Portuguese priests in uh, Kolwal he got them killed also. Now the grounding for this action becomes clearer when you see what the Portuguese Viceroy said. He had promulgated an order dated September 21st, 1667 to Hindus of Bardesh that those Hindus who do not convert to Christianity will have to leave Bardesh and Shivaji Maharaj came to know about this and then using the pretext of pursuing the Desais in Bardesh, uh, he entered Bardesh and Shasti and killed the Padris on the way. The viceroy was so terrified with this action that he withdrew 
and he stopped the order of forced conversion. So this was a very clear cut aim which Shivaji kept in mind. And uh, this is also attested by uh, other sources. For instance, the British East India Company, they also in a report, they told uh, their uh, company that Shivaji and they, the Portuguese, they daily quarrel, the chiefest cause of his hatred to them being for forcing the orphans of his caste, caste means religion in this context, to turn to Roman Catholic. So that establishing Hindu power and enforcing it is the only way to survive as a nation was the unmistakable message that Shivaji had given, which in recent times we seem to have forgotten. Those in the corridors of powers today seem obsessed with placating all the hostile elements, simply every uh, one outside uh, us to win their favor instead of asserting primacy of Hindu India. And this is the sickness that we are addressing when we are talking about Indian nationhood. Shivaji entered in no such calms or weakening sentiments of kindness or uh, in destroy, destroying the enemies of Hindus. And true to his object, he reclaimed sites of previously destroyed temples. This is one of them. This is the temple of Sri Saptakoteshwara. In, it was previously in Narve and it was rebuilt by Shivaji in Bicholim in Goa. There are other temples also he got built in the south of India in uh, Shonachapalli Shiva temple in Tiruvannamalai and uh, Samothir Perumal Vishnu temple which were also destroyed and converted to mosques. Now Shivaji got the mosques destroyed and got the temples built, rebuilt in their places. And this is again uh, confirmed by uh, the East India Company's memoirs in which they say that uh, Shivaji had got the mosques demolished and got his temples built. Now, part of this reassertion of Indic civilization uh, was initiation of steps to uh, resurrect Sanskrit. So we see the same pattern in all the kings who fought back the uh, Islamic uh, conquests. They had the same, they were rejuvenating all the cultural symbols which we are trying to rejuvenate these days when we talk about Sanskrit, we talk about Hindu society, the same thing they were doing even at that time. So he also tried to re uh, resurrect Sanskrit and get uh, rid the native Marathi language of uh, all the impurities that it had gathered with its contact from Islamic rule. And as early as 1646, Shivaji was 16 years old at that time, he had issued a letter with a seal in Sanskrit. He had always, uh, but there are some other things also which Shivaji did. From the very inception of his uh, empire, he kept a few things which according to Hindu dharm are inviolate, which is the uh, honor of women, Brahmins and cows. And this is why uh, he was very strict about in issuing injections that none of these should be hurt. And this is even attested by uh, people who, this, for instance in Munthakabul Lubab, which is a Mughal, uh, this thing, it says Shivaji has always striven to maintain the honor of people in his territories and was careful to maintain the honor of women and children of Muhammadans when they fell into his hands. His injunctions on this point were very strict. Similarly, uh, Shambhaji himself writes in Buddha Bhushan that who is the, uh, that he set up the Brahmins and other castes on a firm foundation in their respective walks of life. So we see he is reasserting the Indian social order and by vanquishing the enemies of the gods with a view to protect and revive the caste religion. This is what Shambhaji himself writes. So there was no uh, dichotomy that uh, I mean there is something uh, there was at that time this social rift that we see these days what simply did not exist at that time and all they were doing is they were trying to protect it against outsiders and reasserting that same system. He also, there are also incidents of his uh, issuing very strict uh, orders for protection of cows and all that and this is the re reason he also had the epithet of Go, Brahm, uh, Go Brahman Pratipalak. Shivaji's era, uh, I mean he, his actually rule from the time of his coronation to his death is very short but then that he had the vision, uh, I mean this was not limited to his local territories, this vision extended to the entire India is also attested by sources. One of them is Bartholomew, uh, Bartholomew Kair, is, he is a French visitor and he has attested that uh, Shivaji, he intended to push his conquest from the river Indus, which forms the boundary of the king kingdom of Cambay, to the Ganges and far beyond to the provinces of Bengal. So obviously right at the inception we see that he had a vision of entire India. In his own last words, these were his last words, uh, he uh, gave this message to Marathas that don't back off, this is a short 
temporal life and all you have to do is just fight back and fight for what is what you believe in now these are very uh, profound uh, things these are not things like secularism and uh, socialism and things that you they you are found in, what you are founded on in your uh, by your uh, civilizational identity you are fighting for that now after shivaji even shambhaji he uh, persevered on that vision and uh, we see under him also there was a lot of rejuvenation of indigenous culture and hindu uh, of indigenous hindu religion and uh, he became the uh, successor of after successor after an intense power struggle but then uh, there was no let up in his efforts to assert hindu power and supremacy he was not basically concerned about you know his own power there's a treaty between the marathas and the east india company which was signed in 1684 two of the clauses are important what uh, shambhaji spelled out on that no human should be brought as bought as slave in my area he should not be converted to christianity and another clause saying that other traders should get the same freedom as the christian traders now these clauses were included in his other treaties also with the uh, europeans so we see from the very beginning the marathas were following a plan it was not about their own power it was about what they stood for and it was definitely a vision of a larger india now in no country they were very clear that in no condition should the could the sensibilities of hindu culture be compromised and an incident in september 15 1684 made it only too clear there was uh, during his expedition to ponda which is in goa uh, shambhaji had a muslim of rank who was a petty commander in his own army he had him put to death for killing a cow one of the expeditions which shambhaji took up uh, with the portuguese is important to mention here now his uh, wrath fell on the portuguese uh, due to again the uh, excesses committed by them uh, and the people uh, the viceroy of goa was so scared that he said also the enemy has openly declared that no trace of the portuguese and the christians should be allowed to remain in goa shambhaji lived up to that threat also and he captured a whole lot of islands uh, there was the uva island bardesh salket and 140 patris he got arrested he got them stripped of their official habits and he got them paraded with their hands tied behind the marathas were unsparing when it came to giving it back and it was not that they were you know debilitated by some thoughts of kindness a misplaced kindness because they knew what they were faced against they, anyone who has read about the inquisitions of uh, the portuguese they will know how bad it was so there was no point of being kind however these delusions we nurse nowadays you know we are kind no matter endlessly how much so these are the false notions that we carry along so and there is an interesting story also at that time when he was on his campaign the viceroy had got so scared that he had uh, gone to uh, there's a background of the saint xavier's festival which is still celebrated in goa and this is the background now the viceroy was so scared that he went to this bomb jesus cathedral i'm sure you've heard about it where the body of saint xavier is he went to the cathedral and he placed his scepter in uh, saint uh, xavier's hands praying for a miracle and just at that time he heard that the mughal armies were coming so this is the so called miracle of uh, goa and that is why he celebrated as the patron saint of goa and there are a whole lot of foolish indians who participated in the name of secularism so <laughs> it is really a pity and he is called the ganesh sahib the protector of goa and instead of uh, you know honoring the marathas who had at that time come they because the hindus had called them now this is a inscription which uh, shambhaji had put over there the hindus had requested him that they were under heavy taxation also by the portuguese that they should be relieved and this is the seal that he had uh, put over there uh, at a place uh, Uh, it is in Han, Hatkolan in Goa. This was uh, installed in Ponda, and uh, this inscription records the abolition of taxes. And uh, it also says clearly now we are under. Uh, this is under Hindu rule. It has got the symbol of the elephant and uh, lotus also. And this is how actually relief was given to the Goanese people, the Goanese Hindus. But alas, nowadays you see other things. So. now uh, we come to a letter which was written uh, by shambhaji to ram singh first he was the son of mirza raja jay singh the first he had written we hindus have become weak without any self respect we have been unable to protect our temples which are being desecrated 
we are unable to protect our religion the yavan batsha thinks that we have failed in following religion the dharma uh, anushunya dharma the state of uh, lack of dharma this shows the um, mindset from which the maratha rulers were acting shambhaji had also captured uh, he was captured by the moguls and after hideously cruel torture meted out over a uh, fortnight along with another companion of his kavi kalash and i mean it is all descri described in alam uh, masri alamgir it was terrible torture he was put through and he was put to death now what aurangzeb actually intended was to scare the marathas and put them off their uh, battle but then it actually had the opposite effect it steeled them it uh, brought the grit out and then they gave it back that was the point there was a famous address which uh, his successor uh, raja chatrapati raja ram had given in fort raigarh and they stopped all relationships with the mughal and then they took up this battle which started it was went on for 18 years and they regained the territory someone had asked me the other day i mean who had uh, set set out the clear aim of that the temples should be okay uh, it was actually not from maharaj shivaji it was i think rahul put that question it was uh, from chatrapati raja ram maharaj when he put out this aims that we will reclaim all our temples and all that he specifically mentioned vishveshwara temple also so this is what he said this is noted in the adnya patra which has been written again by ram chandra pantamatya and he records that this was the aim of the raja ram chatrapati and his queen that on auspicious occasions we cross the narmada while by the favor of god within a short time we will defeat the chief enemy and subdue all territories and forts about delhi and go to banaras and establish the idol of kashi vishveshwara now when raja ram took over the reins a lot of these maratha chiefs they had defected uh, to the mughal side because they were also i mean mughals were too, still at that time still too powerful but he gave a new appeal in the name of desh dev uh, dev desh and dharm our gods our country and our religion and this is the appeal which one by one all his chiefs were won back and although he died very early he died within 11 years but the fight was taken on by tarabai tarabai was of course she is one of the very well known characters and she was a gallant and a diplomatic queen and her resourcefulness uh, was amazing she is the one who rally the uh, scattered marathas and ultimately she was the one who saw the battle right up till the end it was a 18 year old long struggle it was pure pluck daring do and no matter how many times they were beaten back they kept on springing back they kept on attacking the moguls at one point of time aurangzeb came to the deccan and he settled over set up camp over there but the one call which you see in all the correspondences that the marathas sent out to the chiefs or the to, to the other countries was this is the land of gods and the brahmins so you see even here till day there is absolutely no social conflict each uh, person who was fighting with these maratha chiefs were generally from the peasant uh, they were people of the soil so to say there was no conflict there was a belief in the king there was a belief in the natural social order there was a belief in the highest uh, values which are carried by the brahmins and that is why they call it the land of the gods and the brahmins and it is not just one place it is uh, it was initially uh, given mentioned in a letter by uh, raja ram but uh, it is appears numerous times that this is the land of the gods and the brahmins and even uh, this thing uh, fellow feeling with the hindu kingdoms you see that even in the midst of this 18 year old fight uh, there was uh, the nayaks of vakinara in uh, karnataka they had given uh, a call for help and in 1784 the Mar marathas even with their stretched resources they rushed for helping uh, him now finally in 1704 was the decisive victory uh, and aurangzeb was i mean he barely escaped he was escorted by his uh, general zulfikar khan and he was escorted to burhanpur he died a lonely a lonely death we all know uh, in the deccan away from his home and what does uh, what do the histor historian rana day says that did they fight for the smaller was such a doughty battle possible with just a smaller aim what he says was it was a battle for higher it was a higher moral force which was driving down which brought all the virtues of the best of men the daring the heroism and the noble endurance the administrative skill and it was all because of the higher goal and the vision which had been put 
before them by their founder. Now we see this carried on even at the time of uh, Chhatrapati Shahuji who was un in Mughal captivity until 1707 and then after uh, uh, Tarabai, after uh, Aurangzeb's death, he ascended to the throne. Later his mother also, uh, Yesubai, who had been in captivity for almost 30 years, she was also released. Now Shambhat, uh, Shahuji also writes in a letter to his brother, this kingdom belongs to gods and brahmins. The blessings of god Shankara and god Bhavani enabled our great and revered ancestor Shivaji to rescue it from the bands of the Mohammedans. Again, we see the same word used, gods and the brahmins, land of the gods and the brahmins. Now, this, uh, Marathas were of course very conscious about helping Hindu, Hindu rulers and uh, we see it also, we, this battle everyone is very, it's a very well known battle because of the movie Baji Rao. He had rushed to the help of Chhatrasal of Bundel Khand and uh, he had rescued him. The details of the battle are all there in the movie. But <laughs> there's a very important note in Chhatrasal's own biography, which is the Chhatraprakas, which recounts his meeting with Maharaj Shivaji and what Maharaj Shivaji told him. And it says, collect a force and wage war against the Turk, protect the cows, the Vedas and the Brahmins. So you see the same theme again repeated. What was at that time when there were no definite boundaries, what was it which was motivating the people from inside? It was what was there already. Now, it, it was at that time now, uh, Baji Rao Peshwa had also taken, I mean, not just this pattern, he had also undertaken uh, extended campaign against the Portuguese. Now, this is the famous Battle of Vasai. It went on for almost two and a half years. And again, the principal cause for it, you can see, these are the some of the notations from the uh, correspondence and uh, uh, chronicles of the contemporary people. And it says, uh, establishment of Hindu Raj and then Appa Sahib exerted himself at most to conquer Firangana and establish the rule of Hindu Dharma. The Portuguese uh, persecuted Hindus and therefore Appa Sahib invaded Vasai territory and captured one or two places. This temple, uh, this uh, temple that you see is the Naro Shankar temple. This also got a very important, uh, interesting history. When the uh, Maharathas uh, captured Vasai, and uh, what they did was they destroyed all the temp uh, churches over there and they took down the bells. And these bells were uh, installed all over in the Hindu temples and uh, also in lower uh, region which is called the De uh, Desh region. Uh, and uh, that is why you find these Portuguese bells in all the Hindu temples in this particular region in uh, Vasai. This particular bell, uh, no, where is it? This one. This particular bell is also, this is the Naroshankar temple, the bell that is a Portuguese bell on top. So, one of the things which is noted in this uh, campaign uh, is uh, given by G.S. Sardesai in a pa papers that he presented, he got the, the papers from the Peshwa Daftar. One of these papers says that Bajirao and his brother Chimanji worked to pursue the policy contemplated and carried with the chief aim to make the land safe for the Hindu religion. And uh, they not only, they did not stop over there, they also made an uh, arrangement for the people who had been forcibly converted to, these are also among the Peshwa Daftar papers, uh, to be brought back to the Hindu fold. And Mother of Peshwa offered grants of uh, land, uh, free land to those who would settle in the city and instituted a tax in support of Brahmins to purify the native Christians who they regarded as polluted Hindus before receiving them back to the uh, fold and their former castes. Of course, one of the works that we do hear about constantly is that how the uh, Marathas carried out uh, rejuvenation and reconstruction. They constructed a lot of temples and almost entire, all the temples that we see today the stone temples uh, which were built, uh, rebuilt after being destroyed by the Muslims, almost all of them have been built, almost 80 to 90 percent have been built by the Marathas only. Now we come to the battle of Panipat. I'm, what I'm tracing is just, I mean, the thought that the Marathas had all through their struggles because they, they were endless battles, of course, but some of the main battles which uh, show where the Maratha uh, state was focused. Now, Ahmad Shah Afghan, uh, uh, he assumed the uh, Afghan throne 
and uh, called himself Ahmed Shah Durrani or Ahmed Shah Abdali and uh, there was a series of uh, battles, uh, attacks that he carried out on India. In one of the attacks, uh, he had sacked Mathura Vrindavan and the details of this attack can be seen that, I mean, he had given orders that Mathura and other places are the holy cities of Hindus. It is your sacred duty to kill as many non-Muslims as you can and make heaps of their severed heads, promising that he would pay five rupees five for each head. Now, this carried on for one week. And there is even a story, I don't know whether it's true or not, that it was from March 5th to March 12th. And uh, they actually were squirting blood, Hindu blood, for playing holy, for mimicking the Hindu festival. Of course, that can also be imagination, but this shows the uh, magnitude of the slaughter which was carried out by the Afghans. So this was in 19, uh, 1757. When the Marathas saw this, then they started moving their force northwards. And in, by 1758, they had moved to uh, north. They had pushed back the Afghans. And by 17, uh, they had uh, taken a lot of territories in Punjab, in Lahore, Multan, and Peshawar. And then finally, they also went to Atop. The fort that you see here, I hope it is clear. It is the uh, fort which they took in 1758 and the message, the triumphant message that uh, was sent back uh, by uh, the Marathas to the Peshwa Daftar was that we have uh, unfurled the saffron flag at Atok. This happened in 1758. There was a concerted effort by the Muslims. This time by, I mean, there are some prominent Muslims. One was a cleric called Shah Walilullah Dehlavi. Of course, there was Najib of the Rohillas. Najib had been occupying, he had been put on the throne of Delhi by Abdali and the Marathas removed him and they reinstated the Mughal. But uh, they, they all got together, including that even took Saftar Jang, Nawab Saftar Jang, who the Marathas had very good relationships, uh, relations with and even the Mughals. So you see, all the Muslims, they got together and the call in all the correspondence that one sees of this period is of jihad. But what was happening in the Hindu camp? Marathas were repeatedly trying to uh, have, you know, build alliances along uh, uh, with the uh, Jats, uh, with the uh, Rajputs, but they never responded back. They remained uh, uh, aloof and the Rajputs even actually there was found later on that he even had correspondence with Najim and he was okay with uh, them defeating the Marathas because he wanted that somehow the Maratha power from North India should uh, be reduced. So we all know what happened in this battle. Of course, it was a very tragic thing. But uh, what is sad is not that the, uh, there was a lack of consciousness at that time about the unit of India. But it is there even today. One lakh Maratha soldiers. And the only thing that they fought was for India. No one remembers this. There's a small group of history-loving Maharashtrians who go every year to the Battle of, uh, to the Panipat field to commemorate it. But actually it is, it was a national tragedy. Because the only reason that the Marathas were there is because they were hurting Indians. Expedition after expedition, uh, he has uh, uh, Najib, your um, M.H. Abdali carried on in North India. Thousands and thousands of Hindus were killed. Thousands of temples were destroyed in the holiest places of India, particularly in Mathura. They say there was no fortification in that town, and it was there was a complete slaughterhouse over there. He slaughtered the Bairagis. And another tragic fact: I don't know whether you people are aware or not. These same Bairagis, just because of their allegiance to Nawab. Uh, Shuja Uddala, they fought against the Marathas in the Battle of uh, Panipat in 1761. So one can imagine the amount of blindness that people had. They saw nothing apart from what immediately concerned them. They had no vision of India and the only people who were fighting for it were the Marathas. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been there. Now, but one good thing was that uh, this battle, I mean, it was a withdrawal. It was not really an outright defeat for the Marathas because we had even after the battle, uh, he even, Apollo, Abdali even sent an apologetic letter for, because the Peshwa was moving more forces to north of India. There were a lot of problems. We needn't go to all that, why the uh, setback happened. But uh, fact remains that they inflicted such heavy losses on the uh, Marathas, uh, on the, I beg your pardon, on the Afghan forces or the concerted forces that they never attacked after that. Whereas there were six attacks before that, six incursions before that. 
which we have seen, in which there were slaughters of Hindus and loot uh, at such proportion that they say that in the area of North India, the entire uh, from Doab to the uh, UP area and Delhi, treasury was empty. They could not even pay it back. And they heavily taxed the peasantry for paying uh, the in, uh, indemnities for this. So, some observations uh, one must read. These are the observations of some contemporary people. Major Thomas Evans Bell, Evans Bell he was a little a, later, about 50, 60 years later, but he notes this, that even the Battle of Panipat was a triumph and a glory for the Marathas because they fought in the cause of India for Indians. The British noticed it, but the Hindus did not see it. While the great Mohammedan princes of Delhi of Oud and the Deccan stood aside intriguing and trimming, and though the Marathas were defeated, the victorious Afghans retired and never again interfered with the affairs of India again. T. S. Sh uh, Shejwalkar, he is also a famous historian, he says that the Marathas cast the last die in the tragic drama with the slogan of complete integrity of Indian Empire. The Marathas had risen higher, transcending the bounds of race, language, religion and sect. Actually, even more than that, they kept no self-interest. Their ultimate idea was always of the Indians, of India. And they uh, defended themselves uh, from foreign powers uh, without any aid. And they wanted to rule without any aid and interference. Now, what happened after Panipat? We see that even after this, Marathas have not really lost sight. They have continued their rebuilding uh, and reconstruction efforts. One of the biggest uh, reconstruction efforts was taken by Ahilya uh, by Holkar. And uh, by one estimate, 80% of the temples that you see stand, standing today, at, whether it's Vishveshwar, not Somnath, not the main Somnath, but other uh, places also, in Gaya, etc. All these were built by her and they were built by her personal uh, uh, funds, not through the uh, uh, funds of the state. So, uh, all the uh, Jyotirlings, all the uh, Saptpuras, all the Chardhams and all the uh, Tirths and the Pants and everything, she even gave a lot of grants for their maintenance. And uh, this was uh, undertaken and this was done by the Marathas in spite of the fact that they had been so to say actually betrayed by every one of the Hindus until that time. Uh, some of the temples which they did build were in Somnath, Mallikarjun, Mahakaleshwar, Omkaleshwar, Kedarnath, Bhima Shankar, Vishwanath, a whole lot of temples, including even Ayodhya. There was the temple, I don't know whether you're aware of not the famous temple which is there, and it is one of the three structures which were destroyed uh, in Ayodhya, along with the Ram Janmabhumi temple. That was rebuilt by Ahilya. Not the Ram Janmabhumi, but another one of the three temples. Uh, it was uh, rebuilt by Tretaka Thakur temple, it's actually called was rebuilt by Ahilya by Holkar. So, now the ebb of the Maratha power started in, from 1880 in 18 and 1857. It's a strange thing about uh, political power play that somehow in fighting starts because that is how the political game is played. So, there were infighting in among the Marathas also and somehow they could not really work out their alliances and ultimately they were outstripped in contention with the British and outplayed and the final battle uh, of Bajirao Peshwa II, it happened in 1818, for which he lost. This was the third Anglo-Maratha war and then he was forced to Bitur. That was so to say the end of Marathas as a challenge to colonialism. Until now we come to the last phase of the challenge which Marathas had presented. Now this Bajirao Peshwa II, who uh, chose to settle in Bitur, because he was exiled by the uh, conditions of the treaty and his son was Nana Sahib. Nana Sahib and his childhood mates were Tatya Tope and Manikarnika. We all know who they were. They were the principal players of the 1857 rebellion. Again, the rebellion we will not go into because it was long, uh, I mean there are a lot of causes and motivations playing in that. The rebellion itself was, here also the Marathas, they kind of tried to, you know, uh, start uh, talking to even the Muslims and tell them, okay, now we have a, a different challenge, let us get together and fight. The Muslims were again, they had again given out the call for jihad. But then what is the call that the Marathas had given out? This becomes clear when we see in eight, June 1857, Lakshmi Bai along with Tatya Tope, they captured the Gwalior fort. When they unfurled the flag over there, the first slogan which they had given out was Hindavi Swaraj the original slogan of Maharaj Shivaji. 
So, we see that uh, the thread that ran through all the battles which were fought for the Maharata, Marathas, they always uh, carried this theme of Desh, Dev and Dhan. And what we talk about today is a, a very foisted ideas of uh, liberty, equality, fraternity. You know, these all ideas have come from abroad. They've come from a different context. They do not really apply to us. Particularly notions like secularist, socialist, democratic. We study this, but will they inspire us? They will inspire us. They don't inspire us because, uh, and that is why we find there are a whole lot of people who are going on with their uh, interest because there is nothing real in, to evoke in them to say that, hey, this is your country. There's nothing, the only emotional uh, uh, thing that uh, evokes, uh, that awakens them is their religion, is their uh, traditions. But that has been somehow been sidelined. Somehow it has become very evil to talk about religion. Uh, in context of secularism, you can't even talk about religion. And not it is either superstition or uh, simply, I mean, it is an evil to talk about it because what uh, these concepts have also done is that they have brought aggressive religious ideology on the same footing as an inclusive ideology, which is Hinduism. And suddenly, we are uh, we have to concede advantage to uh, those religious ideologies, which were from the very beginning, as we have seen through the history, inimical to us. Is it not happening now? It is. It is happening even today. Every corner of India. There are everyday Hindus being attacked. There are everyday temples, uh, not every day, but every other uh, day temples been brought out. Women are being trafficked. It, uh, the latest report from West Bengal, some of the districts in West Bengal are 40% of uh, Muslim population. 22,000 women trafficked in two years. And most of the people in this are uh, Muslims. This is just, I mean, uh, basic, but the thing is that this attack is ongoing. And the reason for this is that their ideology is intact. But our defenses we have let down. So we see, uh, therefore, uh, secularism is basically, as I said, and now this is to end with the uh, premise which was uh, which I wanted to end, add, uh, end uh, that these same people who had been killing us in the name of religion, destroying everything that our culture stands for, looting our resources, now they are allowed a free run in the name of secularism and even privileges, which should have been actually due to people who are suffering for uh, a millennium. So this is what is the basic flaw with the idea of religion. Two other people have spoken about Hindutva. One of them is, of course, uh, uh, Chandranath Basu. He was the first person who came up with the term of Hindutva. Now, Hinduness as the basis of nationhood. How Chandranath Basu uh, defined it was, it is, he called it, he formed a, he wrote an exposition on the quintessence which forms the consciousness of being Hindu and the fundamental articles of faith of Hindus irrespective of the divergences and, and this was the first all encompassing, uh, all encompassing identity of Hindus uh, as a nation which was made. Uh, thereafter there was of course Savarkar. And Savarkar had, was the first person who actually propounded it as a political philosophy, seeing the land as a whole, and Hinduness being the same thing as nativeness. But there are some problems uh, with these also. Why I believe that these are not the perfect ideations and why Shivaji's ideation was perfect. Uh, because uh, in the case of first, when it comes to Hinduness, if you see through the history, this was not lacking anywhere. Even today, I mean, some of the um, people who are actively acting against uh, acting against the nation, like the Vijay Singh, they are uh, devout Hindus. So they have very clearly that what is it that they stand for in terms of personal values. So that's why it is not something which will serve in the very long run. And in case of Savarkar also, it is kind of uh, being in that zone when you are hoping that the Muslims in the country will see that, oh, after all, they are from this country. And uh, ultimately, this is their nation. Fact remains, an ideological gaping chasm is there, and they will never see it. And just hope, and this is what we see played out in the political scene also. No matter how many times we see, you know, how many times we have been betrayed, we go on persisting. And this is because we somehow want to adhere to them, after all, they are Indians. Well, they are not as simple as that. The moment they convert, they cease to be any part of the Indian civilization. So ultimately, what is the doctrine which is going to be successful? When you say 
with, with conviction, without any doubt, unequivocally, that Hindu paramountcy, Hindu primacy, primacy of Hindu values in every, whether it is in share of resources, whether it is in policy, whether it is in any interface that the government has with the outside powers or even inside, in promotion of cultural ethos, we should not even attempt uh, to make people Indian who are not uh, Indians. Indianness is Hinduness and therefore Hindu Viswaraj, Hindu paramountcy. So this is why I feel that there is no need to go into any detailed philosophy in this. It was a very straightforward, simple do uh, the, uh, doctrine which Shivaji had put, which was Hindu paramountcy. And lastly, I end uh, with the some quotes of Rabindranath Tagore. I don't want to read them out, but basically he also said the same thing, that the ideation of a nation is what Maratha has always held. And because it was this idea which had been put forth by their king. There were other struggles also at the same time. For instance, even the Sikhs were struggling. But even in none of these struggles, we see there's a clear idea of nation. And for 150 years, from 1648 uh, until 1858, we see the Marathas were fighting for the same thing, Hindu nation. So that is the real basis of Indian nation. Thank you.